All right, collectors, uh, it's the beginning of January in the year 2019, and we thought it would be a, a good time to maybe uh, talk about some SS daggers because most collectors want to add at least one uh, to their collection. Uh, and for some reason, although there's books and uh, the internet and all of these things, uh, a lot of collectors seem to be uh, confused about SS daggers. Uh, and we'll try to give you some of the finer points here. Uh, we're going to go through the early pieces, mid-period pieces, and the later pieces. And of course we have a cat to help us here all of a sudden, but, uh, but that's the way it is. But just to start out, I think most of you know that uh, the Chamber of Commerce of uh, Soligen came to see Hitler uh, on his birthday in April of 1933 and convinced him that it would be a good idea if the SA and the SS uh, wore daggers with their uniforms because it would give them uh, esprit de corps and it helped them feel uh, part of the, uh, the movement. And of course he, uh, for the most part, was going to get everybody to pay for their dagger too, so there was no financial loss and put about 100,000 workers in Soligen uh, to be very, very busy because uh, they hadn't had anything to do for the last 15 years or so uh, prior to that uh, after World War I. So after prototypes were made uh, in December of 1933, the orders were given to Soligen to start production of uh, SA and SS daggers. Uh, it must have been a a wild time because the initial SA order was a million daggers and there were about 240,000 SS members at the time so we can assume that the order was also given for this quantity of daggers and about uh, 90,000 or so were to be done with Rome inscriptions. For what it's worth to uh, the Rome inscription pieces uh, were to be delivered uh, prior to the standard daggers that was true in both SA form and SS forms. So we'll show you what, uh, what things look like and how the daggers progressed along the time. And uh, I'll try to give you as many hints as I can on authenticity and things to look for. And uh, we'll see how it goes. It's all off the cuff, so if I miss a few things I apologize. But then again, all this is contained in my book, Exploring the Dress Daggers of the SS. Uh, you can easily obtain a book from me. It's all on our website. It's 150 bucks, but it's, a, it's 800 pages, and it's, um, well, people tell me it's the Bible of the hobby, so you can be the judge of that. So let's get started. All right, with the... Uh, SS daggers, we're going to start with um, initial production, 1934. Uh, the early daggers all had solid nickel fittings, the cross guard, the tang nut, the uh, grip eagle, and the uh, uh, scabbard mounts. The scabbards themselves had a blued finish, uh, which we call uh, incorrectly anodizing, but the word has stuck and that's a term that's used. The um, anodizing did not hold up very well, and in many cases we will see scabbards that have been repainted um, during the period. Now on the uh, Eichhorn initial production example, uh, we'll see that the, the blade, you have the, the normal Mina Era Heist Troy Amato. It was etched into the surfaces, and there was some darkening put in the letter backgrounds to make the motto stand out. Uh, on initial production Eichhorn daggers, we look at the trademark on the reverse, and this was the first mark that they used. We call it the large double oval. It basically has the firm's name and the squirrel. Sometimes we'll see squirrels with a serrated tail. Sometimes we'll see them with smooth tails. Uh, also, something that we frequently see on early Eichhorn pieces, there'll be an inspection number on the lower cross guard. Can you see that there? Not all the time, but most of the time there's an inspection number. Also, the cross guard reverse will be marked with a district number, 
It'll be a Roman numeral one, two, or three. And this uh, uh, was done so that the daggers could be properly uh, distributed. Um, this particular piece is in nice condition and is the kind of dagger that uh, everyone should want to have at least one uh, for their collection. Now other producers that also worked on initial production uh, were uh, Boker, Class, Richard Herder, E.P. and S, um, Bertram Rhine, uh, let me think of who else. Uh, well, I'll think as I go along. Uh, the next dagger we're going to look at is a Boker piece. Um, Boker daggers also have uh, unique cross guards. Uh, if you look at this dagger hilt compared to the other one, notice how the cross guards have a different shape, how the ends are. They don't turn up as, mo as much as other pieces. Um, once you get used to looking at these, they're the kind of thing that you can see ac across the room. But apparently Boker was not able to produce all of the cross guards they needed, so they also used standard guards on their pieces. Again, everything is nickel. You have the uh, blued anodized scabbard, nickel fittings. Uh, in the case of this piece, it is also equipped with an early vertical hanger. Uh, vertical hangers were very popular with the SS. Uh, the SA did not necessarily wear many vertical hangers because they had a lot of different opinions with whatever the SS did, they did the opposite and, and, uh, and whatever the SA did and so forth. Uh, there's always that kind of bickering in any organizations that are working for the same person, which in this case was Hitler. Uh, the Boker blades Normally they have a, 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 a very dark motto. Uh, Boker used a um, better darkening process in the backgrounds of the wretch, so these mottos tend to jump. Now on the Boker trademark, this is the most common mark that you'll see. Um, to me it looks sort of like a mausoleum uh, with a stark leafless tree in the center. Boker also made ground Rome daggers, and when they are made Rome daggers, and when they did, the trademark uh, is different from this one. It's just a smaller uh, circular trademark, and it left more room for the inscription. Okay, and next we'll look at, uh, this is a piece by Richard Herder. Uh, again, all nickel fittings throughout. And in the case of this example, the scabbard has been repainted during the period. Chances are the uh, blued finish wore out and the uh, SS man wanted to look his best. One thing about Herder daggers too, the, the uh, nickel eagle is always a little lower in the grip than it is on other makers. You can probably see that on the Boker dagger next to it. It's just slightly lower and the, the herder grips were also a little bit narrower than normal grips. But again, this is something that you'll get to, to notice after you uh, get into the hobby seriously. And I'll show you the blade on this, the standard uh, SS motto. And then we have the, uh, uh, the herder trademark. There were a couple of large do double ovals. And there's a diamond in the center, which was their logo. And if we look on the tangs of herder daggers, normally there's a raised diamond that's also on the tang. Notice also you have the district marking. In this case, it's number one again. Now the next piece we're going to look at uh, is a, uh, a piece that's early, but yet it's marked with an RZM mark. In this case, 188-35. The dagger is equipped with all nickel fittings, nickel eagle, uh, and it also has a district marking on the back of the cross guard. Now what we have here, uh, the RZM was coming into play very quickly. Uh, this organization was in charge of distributing equipment and supplies that were 
uh, used by uh, the political groups under the NSDAP. So the SS, even though they gave orders for daggers to uh, the uh, uh, makers that I mentioned before, it was really still not enough to supply all of the SS. So there were contracts that were put out for production of daggers and chances are there were half a dozen firms that may have participated in these contracts and they were all assigned a contract number along with the year that it was contracted. In the case of this dagger, it has the standard uh, SS motto uh, and then on the reverse is the contract number uh, which is, I can see it properly here, uh, one 88 slash 35, the 35 being the year it was produced and 88 being the SS contract. So even though this is an RZM dagger, it's made every bit as good and with the same quality uh, as an early piece because it in effect was early. Now I want to show you another dagger that also comes into this same category. All right, another dagger that's also of early production that has RZM marks on it, something we uh, frequently find. Uh, there were two of them. Uh, they were marked 120-34 and 121-34. Uh, both of these dagger types normally have all nickel fittings, just like early pieces, and they have the district mark on the back. Uh, the way the blades are marked, uh, on this one, it's a 120-34 with SS above the contract number in the year and RZM below. And what you'll notice is the, uh, the positioning of the code with the etching um, is readable towards the blade tip. Most of the time we see maker marks reading the opposite direction. And when you see reproductions of this dagger, frequently the reproductions have the trademark uh, the wrong way around. It's also interesting too on these, the, uh, the 120-34 RZM mark has no line through the Z. On the 121-34s there is a line through the Z, through the Z. Just a little thing there that could help you sometime. Okay. All right, next we're going to talk about um, Wait a second. Okay. Next, we're going to talk about uh, the Rome daggers. Um, Rome, of course, wanted to award uh, anyone who was in the SS prior to 1931 with a dagger that had an inscription with his dedication on the reverse. As I said before, there were there were about uh, 99,000 of these made. But of course, after Rome was uh, uncovered as possibly plotting against Hitler, uh, he was eliminated and, and then the inscriptions were uh, ordered to be ground off. Uh, so it's pretty hard to find a, uh, an SS uh, Rome inscription that's totally intact. Uh, we do see a lot of um, ground pieces and we'll get into that in a minute. Uh, in this particular piece. Again, you can, you can readily see that these are Icorn nickel cross guards, especially when you compare them to the other Icorn daggers. See how they're exactly the same. Icorn made their own cross guards uh, and normally uh, they, will, they will be marked uh, HE, uh, -E, which represented house Icorn, but sometimes they're also marked AR. Now in the case of this dagger, it is a full room. It has what you would want to see, an anodized scabbard, all nickel parts throughout. And then when you take it out of the blade, out of the scabbard, it has the, um, the room inscription, which is totally intact. Unfortunately, there's a little bit of pitting here, but we can still see the Icorn trademark. And in the case of room daggers, the trademark was the small uh, double ovals, again to make room uh, for the uh, dedication. So that's the way the full examples looked and 
And a lot of times they'll also have an inspection number below. This one does not. They don't all the time. Uh, and normally they'll have a district stamping, uh, but sometimes they will not because some daggers were not distributed through the normal system and were given to honorary members, etc. So that's the that's the full piece. Uh, and then you also this is a another icon that. Uh, had a Rome inscription originally, uh, but as you can see on this this blade, the inscription has been totally ground off. Uh, however, you can still see the uh, small oval icorn, which was only used with uh, Rome dedications. You can there was a little bit of the um, of uh, grinding on the uh, trademark, but it's not bad. Okay, so after the uh, Rome was eliminated, after Rome was eliminated, um, Himmler, of course, was uh, put in charge of the SS exclusively, uh, and he decided that he was going to uh, issue a dagger with a dedication uh, to all the SS people uh, that were of significance uh, in the Rome purge. Uh, this is one of those daggers. Again, they, they'll be marked uh, AE or um, whatever, and have the same have the same exact uh, cross guards grip. And when you look at the blade, it has the inscription of Himmler uh, instead of Rome. Uh, on Himmler daggers, 90% of the time they'll be marked with an inspection number on the lower cross guard. In this case, it looks like a four. Uh, you'll see these inspection numbers run from zero to nine. Um, and again, some Himmler daggers will have no inspection number. Uh, they do not have a district number because they weren't distributed in the method of the, the previous daggers. Uh, they always have anodized scabbards and a lot of times the uh, scabbard finish on Himmler daggers is mostly still there because we believe that since it was an honor dagger, uh, it was an extra dagger that they had in addition to their normal service dagger. So this is why we see so many Himmlers in good condition. Uh, there's also a document that exists uh, in the form of a letter to Himmler uh, from one of the supply people uh, wondering what to do with some 250 Himmler daggers that were still in boxes as late as 1942. So this also would explain why we see uh, many Himmlers in excellent condition. Uh, we used to think that there was only uh, maybe a thousand Himmler daggers made, uh, but we now know it's more like about 2,500. Uh, they still are pretty rare uh, and have always commanded a, a premium. Um, Himmler daggers are a terrific investment and they've always been. Okay, next we'll go into the mid to late period SS daggers. Uh, we start to see the mid period daggers appearing um, mostly late 36, 37, 38, 39, etc. Uh, the earlier mid-period examples, uh, this one is a, um, uh, from 1937 with a contract of contract number of 806. But the early, earlier examples uh, can have nickel fittings and sometimes can be mixed with nickel plated fittings. Uh, this example has all uh, nickel plated fittings with a painted scabbard. Most mid-period to late-period pieces will all have painted scabbards. In the case of the Grip Eagle, it, it can be nickel or it can be aluminum according to when it was uh, produced. I'll just show you the trademark on, on this example. 807-34, 36, sorry. Okay, and... Uh, and with a piece like this, since it was manufactured in 1936, it's good to see that the um, hanger 
hardware is also nickel plated, not solid, whereas it's solid nickel on earlier pieces. And I'll show you a couple others. Here's, here's a, um, a, a later piece from 1938 with a contract number 1054. On this piece you can easily see the mounts are plated because they're starting to lift a little bit. And also the Grip Eagle is aluminum now. Has the painted scabbard with nickel plated uh, fittings. And if you don't know the difference between nickel plated fittings and solid nickel, just keep a little magnet in your pocket and the plated fittings will always be magnetic. And we'll look at the trademark on this one. There you see that. And we'll show you one more here. Uh, this piece is also a uh, uh, slightly uh, later piece, 1938. Again, the uh, aluminum eagle, uh, nickel-plated uh, hardware on the hanger, uh, nickel-plated scabbard fittings. And we'll show you the, see there's a large RZM shaded circle with the trademark. One thing I'll add too is that uh, uh, a lot of collectors uh, are paranoid because of uh, misinformation that uh, all grips have to perfectly fit the angles of the cross guards. Well, you know yourself that uh, after wood ages, uh, it eventually shrinks. Uh, and this is the reasons why we see some of these gaps. I mean, if the gaps are ridiculous, yeah, it's possible that the grip was changed. But in most cases, if the same angle is still there and the grip is separated just a little from the cross guard in one or two places, uh, these are things that we see. Uh, on the same vein is um, blade fit to lower cross guard contour, the blade shoulders. Um, very often uh, we'll run into daggers where there'll be just the slightest uh, light that you can see between the blade shoulders and the cross guard. Uh, this is not something to get all excited about. Uh, it happened. Um, it's also possible the daggers uh, reassembled incorrectly by some collector in the past causing the, uh, the grip gap. Uh, but these are things that we see. Remember, even though these were all handmade, uh, they're 70 years or older now, uh, and we run into those kind of things, and there's no reason to, to panic over them. It's stuff we see every day. Okay. Now we're going to talk about the model 1936 chained SS. Um, we always refer to it as an officer's dagger, uh, but actually it was not. Um, if you could uh, prove that you had a two-year record with the SS that was honorable, uh, you also qualified to wear the chain dagger. So we do see some of these SS shore fewers, uh sergeants walking around with chained SSs. Um, I'm going to show you uh, a little bit of how they uh, usually look. Um, we have what we call the type 1 chain and the type 2 chain. Uh, those are terms that I invented years ago and I don't know whether they're the best terms but they seem to have stuck. But on this particular chain this is a type 1 and it can be distinguished from the type 2 very easily in that the type 1 on the uh, connecting tabs that go into the clover leaf snap clip, the tabs are uh, all straight throughout. Um, on the type two, it's very easy to see that the, the tabs are beveled. You see that? And another difference on the type two chain is that the clover leaf is solid here. And on the type one, the clover leaf is hollow at the top and you can see the stamping of the hardware producer, DRGM, usually through that hole. 
Okay, now with chain daggers, the type 1 um, chains have a distinct difference on the skulls between the type 2. We'll look at these, these two together as we can here. And you'll see that the type 1 skull on the left uh, is slightly larger and bolder than the uh, type 2 on the right. Uh, the runes are basically the same, but again, the type 1 runes are just a little bit larger. Now, to make it more complicated, there were several producers uh, of these chain assemblies, so you will see subtle variations in both the type 1 and the type 2, but the basic identity factors that I just laid out uh, stay the same. Um, as far as uh, uh, the materials on chain daggers, uh, it's very similar to what we see on the standard uh, Model 33s in that uh, depending on when the dagger was produced, especially with a Type 2 chain, it can have a nickel chain, which all the connecting tabs, links, snap clip fittings will be solid nickel. Um, on uh, later produced pieces, they're made out of nickel plating. Again, you get your magnet out. Um, the Type 1 chains, on the other hand, uh, were always nickel plated. They weren't made in solid nickel. So the Type 1 chains will always be uh, magnetic. Uh, also, you might say, well, how come, how come the links are, have a dark background uh, and the scabbard mount is darker than the ones on this Type 1 where the backgrounds have not been darkened. Uh, this was strictly a choice of the producer. We'll find some that have blackened backgrounds and some that do not. Uh, most collectors prefer the black backgrounds because they make the images stand out a lot, uh, but they have nothing whatsoever to do with authenticity. Uh, also, with chain daggers, you'll find that uh, sometimes the uh, blade will be uh, marked with a manufacturer name, uh, whereas most times it will have no marking. Uh, the daggers with no marking were made uh, uh, completely with their scabbards from scratch. The daggers where we see a maker mark, uh, this was a case where in Germany at that time these men did not have a lot of money. And the real difference in their mind was only the scabbard. Uh, and if they already had a 1933 standard dagger, why not just buy another scabbard instead of having to buy a dagger also? So this happened frequently, and they used their early dagger uh, inside of the chain scabbard. Okay. Um, also, we can talk about uh, scabbard finishes. Um, most, but not all, but most um, uh, chained SS's with type 2 chains um, will have painted scabbards, but the later ones, which this one is, uh, will have anodized scabbards, just the opposite from what we see on Model 33 daggers. Uh, you'll find them painted or anodized either way when it comes to type 1 or type 2. It, it doesn't, doesn't make a difference. Uh, I'll show you a, uh, uh, what I consider an extraordinary uh, SS Model 36. Uh, this example is an early piece. It has a uh, painted scabbard and it has the um, uh, nickel mounts throughout and the backgrounds of the chain and the ramp have been darkened. Uh, you'll notice on the first two links here, the darkening is worn, and that is probably from the sleeve of the original wearer's tunic rubbing against it. Uh, you can tell it's a Type 2. Remember I told you the top uh, tab is beveled inward, and the clip is solid. What's interesting with this dagger, too, is that it has an original SS port on it. This port has not been put onto this dagger. It's original to this dagger. And I'll show you what the original owner did uh, to keep it in uh, position. Uh, this was the official SS tie for chained SS daggers. Very few wearers 
um, kept that type of tie because the uh, the bullion of the cord always got stuck under the scabbard throat and then the dagger wouldn't go in so they they eliminated this but in the case of this man he was going to stick by SS regulations and he's got a piece of aluminum installed here so that the the knot will stay exactly in place isn't that neat and then on occasion if you really get lucky on this particular dagger it has a, um, a beautiful blade uh, but also on the reverse of it uh, it has the original owner's uh, SS number and his initials etched into the blade. Uh, I've researched this dagger and um, uh, this SS man was a member or a graduate of Bod Tolts uh, and that might explain why he was into the spit and polish and doing everything per regulations with his knot. Uh, it's a great, it's really a great dagger. It has everything you'd want to see on an early chained SS, including a very fine uh, painted uh, scabbard, which is the paint is all original and still nearly 100%. And it's also with a, uh, an original uh, belt loop uh, and D-ring. A great, a great piece here. Before I leave the standard uh, daggers, I thought maybe I would also mention too that uh, once in a while uh, on model 34, not model 33 daggers, uh, when we pull the blade out, uh, it not only has an SS motto, but it also has an exclamation point after the motto. Uh, this is something that uh, uh, all collectors like because it's a legitimate variation. Uh, in the case of this piece, it's marked uh, 324-38 SS. Uh, this, this dagger was made by the Klitterman and Moog um, firm, and this was the contract number assigned to them. Uh, I have another dagger that uh, also, let's see, where was that? Yeah, this one also was made by Clitterman and Moog, but made slightly earlier, and this has their previous RZM code of RZM M729, but with the exclamation point on the motto. Okay, and, and with all that, uh, I hope that you got some good information from them, but now I'll, I'll show you a couple of things that are, that are the coup de grace of SS collecting. Uh, and I think this is the only time you'll probably ever see anything like this. So please get ready for, for kind of a thrill. I wanted to show you uh, uh, some daggers here that uh, I think are the creme de la creme of the hobby and which I've been lucky enough over the years to to come across but uh, this particular piece uh, it's uh, it's marked uh, with the Icorn RZM uh, 941-37 uh, and it comes in an anodized scabbard uh, with nickel fittings uh, but what's so unique about it uh, it has a dedication on the blade. Uh, the dedication reads, Gewidmet von der Kameraden der Staatspolizei Darmstadt. Basically, this dagger was a gift from uh, this uh, Gestapo agent's friends, as proven by the fact that it comes from the Staatspolizei from Darmstadt. It's the only SS dagger I know of that can be tied directly to the Gestapo. And not only is it an icorn, but it's in mint, mint condition and the finest quality that you could purchase at that time in 1937. So I hope you collectors all like that. Also the original hanger is on the scabbard. The scabbard is anodized, a beautiful dagger. Now I'll show you a couple other pieces. I think you'll like these. All right, collectors, uh, what we're going to see now are uh, 
the coup de grace of the hobby, uh, and I hope you'll get a kick out of um, seeing these two daggers. In front of me, we have here uh, an SS honor dagger and an SS chained honor dagger. Uh, the honor daggers are extremely rare. Uh, we think there's about perhaps 50 of them known. Uh, the chained honor dagger, to date, there's only five that have ever turned up in the world. Uh, and this one is a beauty. It has the, the uh, oak leaf and acorn uh, silver um, cross guards with silver grip eagle and the typical acorn grip. Uh, the blade is a Damascus piece in fine condition with gilded motto. And you can see the nice pattern of the maiden hair damask in the blade. And I'll show you the other side. It, uh, you can see the nice pattern again. And then the early uh, 33 through 35 uh, trademark. The, um, the scabbard is leather covered. Uh, all of the fittings are silver on this example, uh, including the chain. Uh, the back snap here was replaced as it was going to time, but other than that, uh, you're looking at all original fittings here. The, um, the skulls are beautifully done, and so is the, uh, the runic symbols. Uh, the uh, center ramp is much more uh, elaborate. Uh, than a standard one. I can probably show you that when you compare the two. And you can see that they, um, uh, the ramps here coming out of the center fitting and the upper fitting are different from normal chained SS's. Uh, on the reverse of the chain, uh, it's stamped with the silver hallmarks here and the fact that it's 800. And of course, it has the usual SS uh, proof stamping, the Kultzer Zeichen, as we call it. And the uh, the standard honor dagger much looks much the same, with the exception it uh, does not have the uh, the center ramp and chain. But the daggers themselves are um, are basically the same, with the gilded motto, uh, the nice uh, maidenhair pattern in the blade. I'll show you the other side, and then this small 3334 trademark. So these are absolutely tremendous, and uh, uh, I'm just uh, amazed that uh, that I have them. Uh, um, it's a, kind of a culmination of a career just to be able to handle such uh, beautiful things. The best of the best here, collectors. So I hope you enjoyed seeing that stuff. And uh, if I can do anything for you, just contact me on the email. I try to answer all my emails. I'm interested in uh, helping you with your questions. And if you have something to sell or uh, whatever, uh, consign. We do a large consignment business with estates and with people that are getting older. So uh, please get in touch with me and uh, I'll be happy to help you and always glad to see you. Thank you.